Come on, you bastard, attack. This is some of the first footage ever shot of a great white underwater. Coming in. Now! Doesn't taste so good, that wire mesh. The theme is revenge, a crusade to rid the seas of evil sharks. Gaffed, and the battle's almost over. A second man-eater whose jaws will never again menace an unsuspecting swimmer. In those days, people feared sharks because they knew very little about them. They thought that every shark was a bad shark. And there was a big saying at that stage that the best shark is a dead shark. Attacked by a killer shark is about Rodney, his attack and recovery. Again, it shows Rodney wielding a spear gun, bent on revenge. Time out to reload. The cartridge inside the head explodes on contact. The tremendous concussion is transmitted into the body, killing instantly. But it does twist the truth just a little. I wasn't really after revenge. What I was frightened of was going back in the water and being bitten again. And so I was quite keen to try out the new explosive powerhead that had been invented. And I went underwater and I shot some of these sharks on film to show that man could protect himself in the water. Rod's on a killing frenzy, intoxicated with his success of overriding his fears. This is exactly the scene he had been in need of. In fact, Rodney's attitude was beginning to change, a fact obscured by the dramatic film script. As Rodney's appreciation for the great white began to grow, so too did his expertise as a shark tracker. In 1969, he was called into work on a shark movie unlike any that had gone before. Has that cage been checked out? Film producer Peter Gimbel turned to Rodney to deliver the sharks for his cameras. Well, generally, after they've had a taste, they start really to tear into things and really start to be active. And then you'll let us get in the water. <laughs> I'll push you. The result, the critically acclaimed documentary, Blue Water, White Death. In the crew was diver cameraman Stan Waterman. The two men would become lifelong friends. It's gotta be 12. Oh, yeah, he's been 12. Look at him back. The carnage of earlier films was not repeated. Blue Water, White Death marks the beginning of a new kind of relationship between white sharks and human beings, one that allows the sharks to survive the encounter. For Rodney Fox, the occasional filmmaking stint was not enough to support his young family. So he took up abalone diving, a dangerous but lucrative profession. It would put food on the table for 18 years. But always the sharks weighed heavily on his mind. One of the hardest things was to do over that 18 year period when I was abalone diving was when I had to return to abalone diving the week after I'd been out filming sharks. We'd attracted maybe 10 or 15 great whites around the boat during that week period. We'd had them biting on the cages and taking baits and showing these enormous teeth. And when the film crew had left and everything had quietened down, I had to make my living again and go back in the water only a few miles from where we'd seen all these sharks. I'd had to put on another hat and say to myself, sharks don't like abalone. They generally don't eat humans. You'll be okay. But the first couple of days, I imagine those sharks were looking at me. The danger to abalone divers was genuine enough. Some of the best abalone beds were near seal colonies where white sharks like to hunt. But instead of killing the sharks, Rodney and his colleagues designed a protective working cage for the abalone divers. Then they tested it, 
in shark-infested waters. Rodney, Jaws was the turning point, the moment he finally realized that the sharks needed a champion, and so he set out to debunk the old myths. He started a business, an expedition business, taking filmmakers, scientists, even tourists out into the South Australian seas for face-to-face -face encounters with the real great white sharks. These days, his business serves two ends. It contributes to marine science, and it satisfies Rodney's rather large appetite for adventure. Some experience, I tell you. This scientific expedition will drop anchor in the Neptune Islands off the rugged coast of South Australia to find, film, and study great white sharks. <laughs> Rodney's son, Andrew, has taken over the necessary, if noxious, chore of mixing the key ingredients of burley, a kind of foul stew that sharks seem to find irresistible. Blood, ground tuna, and a little seawater. That's the recipe. Andrew will create a smelly slick stretching several miles down current from the vessel. Any sharks in the area will find the invitation very attractive. Marine scientists from the University of Adelaide want to test the strength of a great white's bite and to identify the telltale signs of shark attack for forensic purposes, a grisly but necessary study. The sharks must be induced to bite a specifically designed pressure plate. First, they need to be worked into a biting mood. Now that the shark has the idea, he gets his tuna on a plate. Keep it in the air anyway, because he's a bit cranky. Running tests on the great white sharks in the wild is always unpredictable. <laughs> the plate is designed to measure pounds of pressure per square inch. 
How are you boys? We're out of the uh, calibration range here. We'll have to recalibrate this. That is amazing. You know, we're looking at the test strip now and that looks as though that's... That's more than the... F this one is 500 kilograms, 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. That one's more than 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds per square inch, enough to puncture metal plating. But what exactly is it that draws a great white and prompts it to bite? Is it the smell of prey or the sight of it or the vibrations it sends through the water? It's all of them have a different field, a different way to swim, a different way of life, but they're all beautiful the way they, they swim and glide and fly through the water. And the biggest and most mysterious of all the whale shark. It's not just the largest of the sharks. It is, in fact, the largest fish in the ocean. But despite its menacing size and appearance, this is among the most gentle and benign of all sharks. It eats plankton, not people. Few in number, slow to reproduce, the whale shark is one of the great and vulnerable wonders of the oceans. Whale sharks, to the diver, have been one of the, the greatest pinnacles of sharks in all the, the oceans of the world. They were the largest shark. They were a docile shark. They were a shark that you could hitch a ride on, or a friendly shark. All the things that the great white shark wasn't. Growing to over 50 feet and 20 tons, the whale shark is so big that it supports other fish, like these remora. They hitchhike harmlessly on the whale shark and eat the food it leaves behind. Ironically, the most visible fish in the ocean is also one of the least understood. No one can say where or when these sharks reproduce, or even how old they grow to be. But some scientists believe they live as long as we do, roaming the tropical oceans in search of food, and occasionally each other. <laughs> 